Uh, once again, this is uh, Sean Baker, Assistant Director of the Stockdale Center, uh, to kind of wrap things up for our, our end of the uh, proceedings here. I'm very excited to present something like a sneak preview of coming events or coming films, if, if you want to put it that way. Uh, with me today is, is Heath Hardage Lee, uh, author of one of the two books here behind me, uh, The uh, League of Wives, The Untold Story of the Women Who Took on the U.S. Government to Bring Their Husbands Back. Uh, a, a good example of a book that tells you its main idea in the title. It's a great <laughs> story um, about uh, uh, Sybil Stockdale, Jane Denton, Louise Mulligan, and other wives, and uh, uh, essentially their second front in, in, in the Vietnam War, and uh, a tremendous effort they made uh, in, on behalf of their husbands. Uh, untold story, certainly an undertold story, and uh, one, of the, one of the reasons uh, we're excited to tell that story is precisely because I can only think of one other book that touches on it, that's the one next to uh, Heath's book, In Love and War, co-authored by Jim and Sybil Stockdale which uh, if you read Heath's book, you can see she relied on and uh, a great story. And uh, uh, the only other thing I have to say in introduction uh, is you may be asking, well, what does this have to do with uh, a, a topic of the conference, uh, Hollywood and films? Well, uh, Heath uh, is, trust me, from previous uh, conversations, very excited uh, by the fact that this book, uh, the uh, film rights were acquired for this book by uh, Reese, w Reese Witherspoon's uh, film company, Hello Sunshine. And as a, uh, should I put it this way, Heath, a price for um, uh, acquiring those rights, uh, they made you executive producer of this film. Yes, which, uh, you're paying a high price for those rights. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so... Uh, that's why we're here, uh, other than, of course, the obvious interest of the Stockdale Center in, in uh, promulgating this story. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, 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 show, uh, I have to say this, we, we, we asked uh, uh, Heath if there was a trailer for the film yet. And due to the uh, COVID hiatus in Hollywood, no, there is not. Um, but they are uh, uh, thick in production, as it were. Uh, and she was resourceful enough to offer us a trailer that was produced for her book, as she's done uh, speaking tours for the book. So what we're going to do is, uh, first off, we'll watch that trailer, which is actually quite good. And then uh, I'm going to ask Heath uh, after that to uh, launch in, if she can, to telling briefly the story of how she got interested in this story of the POWs and the wives and uh, the the uh, uh, friction with the uh, Johnson administration and uh, pressure on the Nixon administration. Uh, fascinating story. And then uh, once she's told that story, um, then we'll uh, uh, morph into uh, an interview section where I will ask her to expand in more detail on that story, as well as ask some uh, type process type questions about the uh, which is bound to be fascinating uh, for those of us kind of looking on the, from the outside, uh, the challenges presented by taking a huge story and editing it down, not only for a book, uh, once you're doing your research, but even more so kind of giving us the Sanka freeze dry version for lack of a better term uh, into a two hour film. So uh, with that, I'll ask our, uh, um, uh, enterprising producer Don to go ahead and roll film and then uh, uh, we'll take it from there. The Vietnam War affected people in many different ways. Vietnam, you typically think of the men fighting the North Vietnamese communists. What you don't think of are the women on the home front whose husbands have been shot down. So they are left at home to cope with the wreckage of that situation. The wives of American prisoners and missing during Vietnam are some of the unknown heroines of the war. 
Once aviators start falling out of the sky um, in larger numbers, the government under Lyndon B. Johnson says, keep quiet. Wives, sit down, shut up, keep quiet. Do not say a word to anyone. The wives can't take it anymore. Sybil Stockdale organizes the women into a national league. Sybil was highly educated. She had drive and ambition, and she had grit. She was even a match for Richard Nixon. Sybil and her League of Wives are forced to go to Washington to constantly remind the government about their husbands languishing in prison and the fact that the government is letting them die. Without the support of Sybil and her League of Wives, many more men would have been tortured and they would have died in prison. These women come from all across the country, from different backgrounds, different races, Jane Denton is a Southern belle who finds out she has a spine of steel when her husband is shot down. Andrea Rander was a Baltimore Army wife who ran a crisis hotline at a mental health clinic. Phyllis Galani left her shyness behind when she confronted the North Vietnamese in Sweden. As young military brides, these women thought they would have a charmed life. Instead, they had to dig deep for resources, strength, and courage that they didn't even know that they had. One of the feistiest women on the East Coast was Louise Mulligan. When you're, when you're fighting for something that is so precious, you're willing to do almost anything. All right, a powerful introduction. Uh, Heath, if I could ask you to uh, give us your um, um, story of how you came to uh, uh, cognizance of this uh, fantastic episode in our history and uh, how the book came to be. Certainly. Well, first, I want to thank Sean for being such a wonderful host. I've gotten to work with him uh, before, so this is a treat. And I want to thank Don for doing such a great job with the production and um, Kelly as well. So thank you. Um, the, to answer Sean's question, and this is a great segue from the trailer we just saw for the book. The way that I came into this story was through Phyllis and Paul Galanti. Phyllis Galanti is that beautiful blonde woman you saw in the video, and also she is front and center on the cover. Her husband, Paul Galanti, was a Navy POW, um, and Paul and Phyllis are Richmonders. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I knew Paul and Phyllis growing up, and uh, Phyllis was in my mother's book club, so I always knew they did something in Vietnam, and that was about all I knew about the story until I came across Phyllis's papers um, at the uh, Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And then that led me to this wonderful story of POW MIA wives and the story of the home front of the Vietnam War um, with folks all over the country. So Phyllis was the one who kind of let me in the door, even though Phyllis sadly um, is now deceased and was deceased at the time I started working on the story. She had died very unexpectedly in, in April of 2016, but her papers and diary led me into this wonderful story. Um, so it's been life-changing for me to just learn about military culture and um, the Navy wives in particular really were the ones that started this whole movement. So let's go to the second slide, and I'm just gonna give you a very quick Spark Notes version if we have any students among us, or Cliff Notes for the older folks like me who use those in school. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a quick version of, v of Vietnam and kind of the setup as we get into the story. So. Many of you were probably not even around when this war was going on. The American war in Vietnam, which was not at all the first, 
prior to our involvement, Vietnam was a French colony. And the, the Vietnamese fought very hard against the French to win their independence. The French lost in a very bloody battle, 1954, the Battle of Jan Bien Phu. And then the Geneva Conference of 1954 split Vietnam into the North and the South. So Ho Chi Minh was the communist leader in the North, the French-educated Emperor Bao in the South. But he was only, Bao was only in the South controlling things for about a year. And then Ngo Dinh Diem takes over, and he becomes our U.S. ally in the South. So the South, we were trying, was a lot more allied with the West, and we were trying to keep Diem in our pocket, so to speak, um, to prevent the spread of communism to other uh, Southeast Asian countries. Now, once President Johnson comes to power, LBJ comes to power in 1964 after JFK is assassinated, the U.S. is going to enter the Vietnam War in earnest. Uh, my book focuses mostly but not exclusively on those involved in the air war over Vietnam, the pilots, so mostly Air Force and Navy pilots who are shot down and become prisoners of the North Vietnamese in places like the infamous Hanoi Hilton, um, where they are horribly maltreated and tortured. But no one knows this at first. Their wives and families on the home front are left to deal with the fallout of these shoot downs at home. And that is the true focus of the book, was to talk about military families on the home front. So let's go to the next slide. Now, I know we have a lot of midshipmen that are probably going to be watching this talk, or I hope you are. And I am quite familiar with the fact that you have many, many guides and uh, rules and all kinds of things like that that you have to follow um, at the Naval Academy. And believe it or not, there are protocol guides or were for wives and families. And these protocol guides start really in the 40s after World War II, but they come really in full force in the 60s. Uh, so there's lots of good practical advice in these about deployments, about um, how to deal with superiors and, and people below you. The whole military hierarchy is sort of laid out in these books. But there's also a lot of not so subtle propaganda in the books about how women, in particular the Navy wife, should act, should look, should conduct yourself, and also how the children should conduct uh, themselves. So the big message for wives and children of Navy pilots or, or Air Force pilots, as we're talking about both here, is to be seen and not heard in the 1960s, to stay out of the way and to keep quiet, to not express opinions about how anything is done. The quote that I, st I still hear from my Navy friends that makes me laugh is, quote, if the Navy wanted you to have a family, they would have issued you one. So we say that jokingly now, but um, in the 60s, I think there was some, some truth in that. They, the Navy really did not want to deal with the, um, the families and the children. It, they were there to kind of be in the background and support the military um, men and not to really cause any problems or have opinions. So of course, going back to your own rule books, rules are often there for good reason. They can be a very good thing, but sometimes as in this case with the Navy wife, um, these rules were meant to be broken and they would be when the Vietnam War came and made these books completely untenable and the tenants within untenable since there was absolutely nothing in any of these books about prisoners of war and what were the wives to do if that was to happen to them. So let's move on to the next slide. Now, Sean talked about the Stockdales. Of course, he is at the Stockdale Center, named for Jim and Sybil Stockdale, who are the superstars of the book. They are the people in the book that the entire narrative revolves around. Um, and I talk about them from their time early on in the Navy on throughout the war and after. So here we have a picture of them in the early 1950s. They are young marrieds. They are idealistic. Uh, Sybil is a highly educated uh, New Englander from Connecticut. Jim 
comes from Abingdon, Illinois, and he is an ambitious fighter pilot climbing the ranks. In my book, I call them the ideal fighter pilot and the ideal fighter pilot's wife, as indeed I think everyone regarded them as such when the book really begins, which is when Sybil and Jim are in their 40s, very early 40s, and all hell is about to break loose with the Vietnam War. So Jim, to, to continue along that path, so Jim misses out on the Korean War. He's kind of upset about that. He's trained to go to war, but he does not miss out on the Vietnam War. He is, is deployed there, and in 1965, September 9th of 1965, he is shot down by the North Vietnamese, and he will be the highest-ranking naval POW in the North Vietnamese prison, the Hanoi Hilton. Sybil automatically takes over with the POW MIA MI wives in her area. They are based at this point in Coronado, California, and Sybil takes over, as uh, those of you in the military are well aware, uh, a spouse's status reflects that of her husband or, or the wife, um, in this case now today. So she takes over as the senior ranking naval wife in Coronado. And this is automatic. Everybody understands that she should and will take over and kind of be the mother hen to the other wives in this terrible predicament. So she will go on after this eventually to found a national organization called the National League of Families to try to rescue and account for the missing men and get the imprisoned POWs back him, which is the whole mission of these women who are stars of the book. Now we'll go to the next slide. Now, another Navy couple, Jane and Jerry Denton. So now we're going from the East Coast, um, I'm sorry, from the West Coast in Coronado to the East Coast in the Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, where Jerry and Jane Denton are stationed at the time of, of the story. Uh, I love this picture. This is a picture of Jane and Jerry in the south of France, where they had a very glamorous uh, so, uh, sort of deployment for, I think, about eight months near Nice, which sounds pretty ideal. Uh, he looks like Tom Cruise from Top Gun. She looks like Jackie Kennedy. All is great. They're living this idyllic Navy life until Jerry is also, like his classmate, like his Naval Academy classmate, Jim Stockdale, also shot down. He's actually shot down several months before Jim in July of 1965. He also ends up in the Hanoi Hilton with his former classmate. Little did they know that they would end up there and they would both be the two senior Navy guys um, in charge. Now, the reason Jim is ahead of Jerry is because Jim's grade point average is two tenths of a point higher than Jerry's was at the Naval Academy. So remember that when you're studying for exams, you know, like, I don't know if you want to be the top one though, because of course, Jim was the first one to get tortured beyond belief. So depends, maybe you want good grades, maybe you don't, but I thought that was interesting. That was how the rank was decided within the prison walls was Naval Academy grade point average. In any case, the two wives, now Jane and Sybil, are linked by their husbands being together in the Hanoi Hilton, and they would be probably the two biggest leaders on the West Coast, Sybil being the one who starts this entire POW MI movement, and then Jane joins her on the East Coast with some very strong allies like Louise Mulligan, another Navy POW wife. Um, and others like Phyllis, who's come in to support all the wives in their uh, cause to get the men home. Now, we will move on to the next slide. Now, if we had more time, I would actually show this video, and I would suggest you go back, if you have not seen it, go to YouTube and look up Jeremiah Denton Torture video. Um, you can find this anywhere. This is a still from, from that particular film. So after Jerry had been imprisoned for uh, just a little bit less than a year, his North Vietnamese captors, the communist captors, forced him 
to take part in a propaganda film. And what their goal was, was to get him to renounce his country, to say he didn't believe in what he was fighting for, and he had converted to communism. Um, if you know anything about Jerry Denton, he would do the exact opposite and then some, which he proceeded to do at great risk to himself. His quote in my book is that he was going to go to this interview and blow it wide open. So there was never a thought of collaborating or complying with this, though he had been severely tortured by his captors. So he um, has the brilliant idea while he's being filmed for this interview, he blinks torture, T-O-R-T-U-R-E, in Morse code with his eyelids, which is so brave and so out of the box thinking. He did not learn the sincere school, but he probably adapted those techniques he had been taught to the situation. So that that was a pretty brilliant move. And, and I highly recommend you take a look at this. It's, it's pretty chilling, but it's also pretty inspiring to watch. Let's go on to the next one. Now, this one is of Sybil Stockdale when she begins her secret coding work. And this was all highly classified information for quite a while, but now has all been declassified. And um, I try to talk only in very broad strokes about what was done coding-wise in the book. Um, but Sybil is recruited by a man named Bob Burroughs, who I talk about a lot in the book. He was a naval intelligence officer. He had been a spy since the Cuban Missile Crisis, highly trained in things like coding. Um, so he recruits her, telling her she had better think long and hard about participating in this. It's a life and death endeavor. If Jim is caught co coding letters back and forth with her, um, he'll probably be executed. Sybil knows that. She feels that Jim would want her to take the risk, and she agrees to work with Burroughs. So the reason I show you a picture here of Sybil with, uh, these were, were actually yellow roses, she would always send a Polaroid picture with herself with roses in any coded letter that she sent to Jim. Now, what she had to train Jim to do was to soak the, the Polaroid in uh, some kind of liquid. He, uh, the first time he does this, he soaks uh, the Polaroid in urine. When he figures out he needs to soak it, when he soaks that Polaroid, this invisible ink uh, letter comes up telling him what's going on, telling him this is going to be how they're going to communicate. He can dry this out, this letter out, these instructions out, and write back on it in between the lines, um, and they will receive the message. There's a lot more details in the book about, about how this exactly works and how she cues him to do that, but it is a fascinating kind of James Bond part of the tale, appropriate since he is James Bond Stockdale. I mean, you can't have a better name than that. So he does end up being very much of a James Bond and Sybil ends up being a Jane Bond. And this is one of the primary ways that the Navy is able to communicate with the POWs. And they've been signaled about the torture they know is going on earlier from Jerry Denton's video in May of 66. And they know, Naval Intelligence knows almost immediately that he's being tortured because of his blinking in Morse code. Um, so that is how the coding starts with Sybil and many other wives are recruited, Phyllis Galanti, Jane Denton, many others are recruited to also code secret letters to their husbands. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, this lovely lady, Andrea Rander, is an army wife. So she is uh, not in the Navy, but that's okay. She's super amazing rock star. So we'll welcome all forces to this book and do. Uh, even though most of the POWs and the MIAs are Air Force pilots or Navy pilots, there are a few from the Army and the Marines that become POWs. And Andrea's husband was um, an Army sergeant, but he was in Army intelligence. And he is captured in 1968 during the Tet Offensive in Hue. So he's kind of in a different part of the country than where Jerry and Jim are, are housed until the end. Um, her husband, Don Rander, is severely tortured, is kept in a house in South Vietnam with six others. 
several of whom um, die in, in being in prison this way. He eventually makes it to the north and, and that in the long term ends up in the Hanoi Hilton. But Andrea knows none of this. She just knows he's been captured in the Tet Offensive. He's MIA for a while. And then she finds out he is a POW. Um, this, again, in 1968, this is a little later than Jerry and Jim shoot down a couple of years after theirs. So Andrea comes into the story a little bit later, but she joins forces with the Navy wives, the Air Force wives, and the Marine wives in this predicament together. And they all form something. Eventually, they form a national organization called the National League of Families, for prisoners and missing in Southeast Asia, short form the National League. Andrea is the only Afri African American member of the founding board of the National League. Sybil will be the, she is the founder and the first um, kind of executive director or coordinator of the organization. But Jane Denton and Andrea are both on the founding board. Phyllis Galanti will eventually also be the coordinator of the National League. So all these ladies play different leadership parts at different points in the story. So we can move on to the next slide. Now, moving along in time, now we're moving to 1969. And you will notice that LBJ, who I mentioned earlier um, in my talk, I didn't even bother to show you a slide of him in this talk. Um, he doesn't do a great job in Vietnam. He pretty much, the Vietnam War uh, puts a nail in his political coffin. He decides not to run again in 1968 because things have gone so badly with that war. So we have uh, a new contender for president, Richard Nixon, who you might know lost in 1960 to JFK, but now he's got another shot. It's a different time. People are sick of the war. And the wives want someone, anyone but Lyndon Johnson, to come in and end the war and get things out. What I didn't mention about Lyndon Johnson earlier is he enforced something called the keep quiet policy, an older policy that said the wives and families of POWs and MIAs could not talk at all about what had happened to their missing or imprisoned husbands. They could say nothing to anyone except those in their immediate family and, of course, the other uh, wives, Navy, Air Force, Army wives in that predicament did talk to each other, but they were not allowed to say anything. And this went on for years because the Vietnam War, these POWs were held as long as eight years, very different than previous wars where prisoners were held for short periods of time or shorter than that, much shorter. So Nixon takes a different approach, um, partially because the wives force him to. In 1968, Sybil has already gone public in the newspapers telling people about the predicament of the POWs in broad terms. She does not tell them about the torture specifically, but she says the Vietnamese are not following the Geneva Conventions of War and the world should know, which is kind of a veiled way of saying that they're completely non-compliant with treating the prisoners um, as they should humanely and accounting for the missing. Nixon uh, knows already from his colleagues like Bob Dole and Ronald Reagan, governor of California, and Bob Dole being Republican senator from Kansas, that he better get on board with these ladies. He better listen to them um, or else. Uh, so he chooses to see them as an asset, not the liability that Lyndon Johnson saw them as. And indeed, that is the correct choice. So while they have already gone public, Nixon gives the ladies um, a, a bigger platform, an amplifier to talk about uh, what is going on with the POWs to make that an issue that all Americans um, un unite behind. Everybody can get on board with this. So there are political reasons for that I talk about in the book, but it's a wonderful change of tone for the POW MIA wives. Sybil in her diary says, dark, dark days under the Johnson administration, bright, sunny days under Nixon. So it's a sea change from what they were used to. Now we'll go to the next slide. So rapidly moving along, the war is finally over. January 27th of 1973, the Paris Peace Treaty is signed. 
the war ends. Of course, there's a lot of things to wrap up. It takes several more years to really close everything down. But part of these agreements is that the POWs must be repatriated. That is not the case in all wars. And that is what one of the big things these women were lobbying for. So they come home. There are 591 POWs that return. Um, and I won't go through all the various stages of return, but I have a picture here of Jerry and Jane Denton reunited. Uh, everyone, all the POWs flew through the Philippines first to debrief. Then they go to their home ports, their home stations. So he goes to Naval Station, uh, Norfolk, February 15th of 1973. Jane and Jerry, by the way, I should have said this right up front, have seven children. So Jane has been rather busy uh, helping run the National League and dealing with her rambunctious brood. So now we have uh, all seven children are, are in this picture, plus two new daughters-in-law. So it's just, it's a wonderful picture. I love it. Everyone is so joyful and so just amazed that they're together again. So that is on the East Coast. So now we'll go to the West Coast with the next slide. So Jim Stockdale's return home the same day, Naval Station Miramar, so San Diego area near Coronado, where Sybil is based, February 15th of 1973. And here are three of the kids, Jim, Stan, and Taylor. Sid, the fourth one, I always tease about this. So Sid uh, is not in the picture because he had a championship hockey game at school. He was at the Kent School in uh, Connecticut at boarding school. And this is a sporting family. They all agreed he had to go to that game. So he plays in the game. Then he comes home on the plane that night. They're all together for dinner and uh, have an all-American steak ice cream dinner and are just thrilled to be back together. So that's that return story on the West Coast. And now we'll go to the last slide. Now, I talk a lot in the book, of course, about the POWs. They're often at the forefront. Uh, but the MIAs are a crucial part of this story, and I talk a lot about the MIA wives. I have several that I spotlight in the book because the end of their story is so very different than the end of the POW wives' story. So the National League, of course, goes right up until the end, until that POW uh, return in 73, which takes place in February and March. And then the POW wives almost uniformly just leave immediately and go home to take care of their husbands. Um, the MIA wives understand, but they're very hurt because they're kind of left at the office and, and just mentally holding the bag. Um, many of them, their husbands, they will never even get remains. So they're at the last count, there are five, uh, 1,587 American servicemen still missing in Southeast Asia from this, this terrible war. So those wives are kind of left holding the bag and um, are very, you know, are a bit resentful, understandably, that they're kind of left to run the show. Uh, the MIA stuff continues to go on today, of course, and the National League still exists just to deal with MIA scenarios. So that continues today. But quick takeaways, and I'll wrap this up about the wives, the League of Wives and these women. The takeaways you should remember from the story are this that these courageous POW MIA wives themselves to change the history. They did not rely on the military or the government to do this for them. They knew the keep quiet policy was the wrong call and they went public with great risk to themselves and possibly their husband's careers, but they decided that was the right thing to do by alerting the media to the torture and the terrible treatment that the men were suffering, they were able to save lives. No less a source than one of your Naval Academy compatriots, uh, the late Senator John McCain confirmed to me that the wives' efforts had made all the difference. He himself was a Navy pilot shot down um, and almost tortured to death by the North Vietnamese, but he refused to leave 
without his other servicemen. Very brave, um, considering how ill he was. He almost died, but would not go home without the others that were with him. So he told me that due to the wives speaking out in the media, at least in part, um, that he attributed it at least in part to that, the torture they had all been experiencing stopped very suddenly in 1969. McCain was moved from solitary confinement to a cell with 25 others. He had better food, better medical care, and mail almost instantly. And he told me it was like a light switch going off. He said it was not at all gradual. And as I uh, mentioned before in another um, topic related to this, the women also made sure that the POWs, repatriation, and the best accounting possible of the MIAs were part of the Paris Peace Agreement. This is not the case in all wars. It is not always a given that POWs are returned and the missing are accounted for. Not at all. But they made sure they were not going to support Nixon or Kissinger, that administration, unless that was written into the peace agreement, which is huge. Finally, the League of Wives changed the role of military spouses forever. They went from by the book, Navy wife, Air Force wife, rules bound uh, wives to human rights act advocates who demanded accountability, not only from the North Vietnamese who were holding their husbands, but also from their own government. So that's kind of a quick overview of the story. And I am looking forward to talking to Sean about other aspects of the story. Thank you, that was a wonderful summation. Uh, I don't, I, I think we can just stop here. We've, we, you've done the story so well. Um, <laughs> Thank it, you. It, really, it, it drove home to me, uh, I think a, a central theme of this book and this story, and it it uh, it grows out of the fact that the Vietnam War was, as is often described, the first televised war. Yes. And mm -hmm. if, if you think in terms of plot development for a film, I mean, or a, a book, or I think I think you have to consider, as it were, the three main characters. Uh, right. Kind of a kind of a triangle here. You've got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, on one point of the triangle, you have the uh, POWs, their wives, and I would say uh, naval intelligence. Yes. They are, for lack of a better term, media savvy, aware of the power of propaganda. Okay, mm -hmm. on the other triangle, you have another group who's somewhat less media savvy, but still very aware of the power of propaganda. And that would be the North Vietnamese, Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese. Right. Yeah, they're, they're ham-handed in some of their attempts to generate propaganda. As you as you noted with Jerry Denton, he was able yes. to find an opening. And uh, another classic case is Dick Stratton uh, with oh, the, uh, yes. the famous film of him bowing very exaggeratedly and acting robotic for the precise purpose of letting people know what was really going on. Um, yes. So, you know, they're not quite as media savvy, but they're aware of the power of propaganda and they work very heavily right. to make sure that their point of view ends up going into uh, the living rooms of America and the evening news every day. And you know, with the cooperation of uh, anti-war and leftist organizations, they were somewhat successful in doing that. Mm. Now, right. the other point of the triangle is, uh, at least at the beginning of the story, the Johnson administration, um, mm. their, their attitude toward the potential power of propaganda is almost a defensive crouch. They're very yeah. afraid of it. They think if they just hide the facts that, uh, you know, this war is almost an inconvenience, it needs to be set aside so he could, he could uh, pursue his domestic policies. Um, so they're inept with the propaganda. And where I think the power of this story comes from, and I'm sorry this isn't so much a question, but um, the power of the story is that the, uh, the, the wives in concert with Bob Burroughs eventually bring the U.S. government uh, 
in the person of the Nixon administration around to uh, uh, the need for a recognition of the power of the propaganda. And yes. yep. I, I think that's such a big theme in this story. Mm. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, because you've interviewed a lot of these people, um, in terms of the uh, individual characters that were aware of this uh, aspect of the story earliest, um, I'm tempted to say uh, that's going to be Jane Denton, Sybil Stockdale, Bob Burroughs. Anybody else? Was there anybody else in the administration or uh, out there in the country that was aware that this is the way they were going to have to fight this battle? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, Sean, I think you've hit on it, like the press, the media and the press, so topical today as well. But these women, and I think there were others besides Sybil, Andre Rander became very adept. I didn't get to talk much about her today, but she became extremely adept at using the press. I mean, the media, it was a little bit different because the media here was very sympathetic to the women and their cause. The POW issue became a uniting cause in a very divided country. Um, so this was a topic everybody could get behind. Everyone felt terrible for them. And the women were smart enough to be objective that they themselves were useful, even though they were not damsels in distress whatsoever. They were 100% in charge, but they were savvy enough to exploit the damsels in distress media image to get the sympathy needed to have everyone absolutely despise the North Vietnamese for treating them so badly. They even took their kids to Paris to confront the North Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese would not let them, the children or the wives into the embassies. And this only served to make the North Vietnamese look like they were just horrible people, which they actually were in that instance. So, um, you know, in that particular time, they just did not understand sort of how negative their diplomacy was looking to everybody else until it was splashed all over the newspapers and television. Yeah. And, and what I found fascinating in, in the book, too, is uh, there was kind of a two-stage process. In this. At first, the wives did approach uh, domestic press, either on an individual level or in small groups. But then at some point, they realized we're not going to get the attention of Life magazine, the New York Times or whatever, unless yeah. we have literally an organization behind us with, with letterhead. <laughs> and I remember it's this part silly, of your It's silly, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they, they got together with Bob Burroughs and they said, look, okay, what we need to do is create this organization, look, make it look to these people like there's this big monolith out there behind us. And maybe <laughs> exactly. then they will pay attention to us, you know? Exactly. It, I yeah. love Sybil's yeah. comments about that. She's like, I just pretended I was the fairy godmother. I waved my wand and made it so. And, and the way she, I mean, that's it. You know, she was yeah, so yeah. smart. Yes, so and then smart. they have an operating budget, literally, of like $35 or something <laughs> exactly. like that. Exactly. <laughs> but the fact no that money. they had the letterhead, and they knew they were savvy enough to know that that letterhead would get attention from the media. Yeah. I love that Brilliant. aspect of the story. Yeah, it is. I love that, too. Uh, it's all about optics. You know, same thing now. It's how it looks. It's not how it necessarily really is. And they were savvy enough to get that, you know, to not have to have that explained to them. So, um, yes, they were way ahead of their time with manipulating yeah. the media. Yeah, and, and uh, very effective at it. Um, now, I know we're, we're a little bit limited in time here, and the, uh, the uh, uh, object of the conference here is to talk about film and uh, Hollywood and how the uh, military life is portrayed in film. So... Uh, without giving away any proprietary information <laughs> as it were about the, about the uh, film project you're, you're executive producer with, I'd like you, if you can, to talk a little bit about what it is like to be an executive producer after doing all of this research and having all these great stories to tell and realizing a lot of it's going to have to go on, as it were, on the, on the uh, cutting floor, right, uh, oh, to make a movie out of it. Uh, yeah, it's heartbreaking, I imagine, and and 
if you could tell a little bit about the process of how you work with the production team and the screenwriters to make those difficult decisions. I can't imagine yeah. doing it, honestly. Well, you alluded earlier too, to it's kind of like, that's the second half of the process. The first half was the book and having a million, as you well know, um, a million fantastic stories about the POWs, the MIAs, the wives, the children, and then having to find three main threads, three or four main themes and cut, cut, cut everything else. And it's so hard because it makes people have hurt feelings and, you know, things like that. But you, you have to just have a representative sample of this to represent the broader population. So the way that I cut that down was to choose the women who were leaders in the National League of Families, whatever branch of the service they were in. Heavily Navy, by the way, I always tell the Navy wives I have to give them a shout out because it was the Navy wives that took the lead into into that, which is so great. I just I love that part. Um, but, it, you know, but then the Air Force wives followed the Army, the Marines in proportion to um, that population. So there was that. That was how I cut that. That was kind of a simple way to keep it focused. Now, with the movie, um, you know, you, as a writer, you and I, executive producer from for whatever that's worth, I mean, it does give you more control over the story. And I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to have that role. I think that's really important if you're an author. It does give you some control over the story, but with the limitations of film, and this is meant to be probably a two hour feature film, that's the direction we're headed instead of like a series. So it's got to be very tight. And there are so many women in this book and, and maybe more than I even shouldn't have, should have had. So we're going to have to focus on pro probably you know, four or five main ones to make this compress into a two hour film. And certainly, um, and I, you know, I don't know anything for sure at this point, we, we've got a draft of the script, but it's got to go through a number of other drafts. Um, it, you know, it's going to be interesting to see which, I can see the scenes in my head and we've had some talks about which scenes are key, which are most important. Um, but, you know, you never know what will end up in the film and what will be on the cutting room floor. And my role has been to suggest things, to put ideas in the head of the screenwriter, to correct details, to keep it historically accurate, to keep the timeline accurate. But we're not still at the point where I know like what all the key scenes will be. Uh, the one thing I can say with 100% certainty is that Sybil Stockdale is the major star of the show and and jim i'm sure he will be in the hanoi hilton sadly but he will be a big part of it as well uh, but as for who else ends up being in it i can't i can't say a hundred percent for sure but there'll be the usual suspects i think it'll adhere you know pretty pretty closely to my book in in that respect and hello sunshine's been wonderful to work with and they have really solicited historical details they want it to be accurate and as a writer, that is really uh, reassuring to me. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I can just, I, 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 I almost envision the film as being a, something like uh, In Love and War in Structure, where maybe they go back and forth between Jim and Sybil. I think yes. that would, I mean, that makes I this book every, absolutely riveting. I, I, well, I loved In Love and War. And as you mentioned earlier, that was a, a touchstone. My copy is... At, fallen apart it's like dog-eared their pages out of it i've ripped it to shreds so i loved that book and i did have the screenwriter you know i didn't want to overwhelm her but i said you must read in love and war and read that in my book and you're going to be covered um so you know and then i sent her bushels of other stuff but those you know th those are the key text and and theirs is what everything springs from i think what my book does is it covers more of the East Coast, more of the other, the things outside the frame of In Love and War on a national scale. So you can yeah. see all the groups across the country. And that was the piece that had not been put together. And it, it took, you know, almost five years to do it. It was, uh, 
nothing was written down. The current National League did not either did not share with me or did not keep any records from that time. So it was a lot of it was like stitching a quilt together, you know, or piecing a big giant puzzle together. Um, so I just did I got as complete a picture as I could. But I think I hope there'll be other books that fill in other pieces of it. Yeah, I, I remember when I first read your book, I, I think it, it it plays the role that uh, the volume Honor Bound does uh, by uh, mm -hmm. oh, uh, Kylie yes. Rochester, Kylie's right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is an amazing job of interweaving all the stories, not only of the prisoners in North Vietnam, but South Vietnam as well, and putting amazing. it in a broader political context. You do that job for the uh, story of all of these wives in the Lee back oh. in the state. And you have almost as much notes in your book as he does. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not quite as much, but I mean, that's a huge compliment, Sean, because that, that was my touchstone for the POW side. And it was so well done and just so beautifully woven together. And, and frankly, a much bigger job um mine was a little more select because not all of the pow and my wives were in the league you know what one thing i didn't really talk about is some of them thought that was a really bad idea to be that outspoken that activist you know yeah. so i wasn't covering quite as broad of a group but um but yeah the kylie book is fantastic and i tried my best to be like that so that's a huge compliment thank you and uh, I guess we can close on uh, just another observation, another con uh, comparison of those two books. I think uh, uh, Kylie uh, and Rochester uh, have a strong sense of stewardship, as it were, make making sure the story is preserved and told, the uh, truth will out, if you will. And I, I, I get the same uh, sense of mission from you in this book and you've done an invaluable service, not only for historians, but uh, the general public and screenwriters. <laughs> oh, so, um, thank you. Well, you do feel, um, I felt a real responsibility and that's why maybe there is some people said, oh, there are too many people or I can't keep up with all these facts. Well, part of the job of this book is to write it down, is to preserve it. And maybe there's too much, but who else is going to capture this? I mean, this had been lost before. So I did feel a responsibility to maybe write a little more than I should have just to make sure it's there. So if people go yeah. back and they want to write more, the resource is there. So um, again, a lovely compliment. Thank you. Yes. At the very least, you're providing breadcrumbs for other people to do follow on work. Exactly. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much, Miss Miss uh, Heath Hardage Lee author once again of the league of wives it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure on an on ongoing basis uh working on a film project of our own here at the stockdale uh, stockdale center uh, we are working on a documentary uh, uh based on interviews with 18 uh, returned pow's uh, yes thank you very I've much loved being part of that to you so yeah. It's been a, once again, you're the subject matter expert. It's been wonderful. Thank you and for having that, me. All right. And with that, we will uh, send it back to our producer, Don. Don, thank you very much. And uh, uh, hope everybody enjoys the rest of the conference.